You're now listening to Sound Talent Media. Check out more shows at SoundTalentMedia.com. When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Allo or Allbirds, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and great marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling, and for shoppers, buying, simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. Nobody does online business better than Shopify. It's home of ShopPay, the number one checkout in the world. You can use it to boost conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going through to checkout. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income to upgrade your selling today. That's shopify.com slash income. What is up, good people? Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. This week, I am talking to Federico from Frozen Crown. Frozen Crown started as a solo project for Federico in 2018 and has since gained millions of listens around the globe. Yes, they are an Italian power metal sensation, and I was so excited to talk to him. We had a great chat. We went through his whole history. Basically, we took the guitars from his first band all the way to what he's using now, and some of them are not going to be what you expect. This one was really fun. We started with like this one bass question and just ran the whole episode through. It's a really, really good time. Also on this episode, and patrons will find this funny, I had a bit of an interruption. Legendary jazz guitarist Mike Stern was also supposed to be recording with me that day, and record we did. And he actually, you know, wires get crossed with time zones and whatnot, and he actually showed up early. He showed up during this interview. Uh, So you'll hear uh, a few interruptions where Mike showed up, and that is literally the first time that has ever happened to me while recording this podcast. So it was quite funny, and we, we hung up you know, once we got everything sorted out and Federico was like, was that Mike Stern? And so <laughs> it was uh, it was quite funny. But the episode itself is really good. We dive in headfirst into the history of the band, into his history as a musician. And we, we really went really deep on this. So if you're a Frozen Crown fan, this is going to be a very special one for you. And if you are not familiar with the band, well, Click in the description of this podcast or go wherever the words are for this episode, the show notes as they used to be called, and go click on the links there and do some digging yourself. I think you're going to like what you find. All right, without further ado, let's get into this episode with Federico. Here we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Tone Mob Podcast, the show about guitar stuff occasionally, sometimes. I'm your host, Blake Weiland, and with me today, I have Federico from Frozen Crown. What's going on, dude? Hey, guys. Uh, It's going on pretty well. Thank you so much. Um, Mm -hmm. Very happy about this uh, specific moment, you know, because we are about to release our new album under Napon Records. This is an album we longed for for a years probably uh mm-hmm. we've been working on this since more than uh, than a year and uh yeah we are really stoked and very happy about the, the feedback so far uh mm-hmm. for, for the the first singles so i'm really really happy about to go on tour in uh in a week mostly yeah. cool cool where at yeah. we are uh, playing uh, at Again, we are doing again um, a European tour, uh, opening mm-hmm. for Camelot, actually. Oh, uh, sick. Yeah, and uh, we are also currently working on something else for the next year, so I'm really happy about that, yeah. Very cool, very cool. Well, let's, uh, let's take a little journey, I think, is probably the best place to start. You've been in the band for a long time. Obviously, mm-hmm. you guys are very good, you know, very uh, technically proficient. <laughs> And you got your own, you know, carved out your own style within the niche of, of metal. But I would like to kind of take a few steps back before that. I, I don't think you just woke up one day and all of a sudden we're in a successful band. So what's your musical <laughs> journey been like? You know, when did you start playing and how did you get into all this? Like, what was your first guitar? 
Okay, absolutely. So my first guitar was not mine because, uh, the fir- I mean, the first guitar I put my hands on was my father's guitar. It was a Suzuki acoustic guitar. Mm-hmm. Still have that right now. Still have that right now. And uh, I was basically trying to imitate him because he was, he is still a, a great uh, guitar player, mostly on the blues uh uh side and um mm-hmm. i tried to touch that guitar when i was less than three years old so i was very i, w- I was even able to, to stand on my feet actually um wow. after that yeah yeah after that i started uh playing uh acoustic guitar actually studying that just a little uh but the first electric guitar i had was and this is why i was was this one Ah, oh wow. Uh, yeah, this is an uh, Ibanez, uh, actually this is an RG240 uh, uh, mm-hmm. from uh, 1986, if I'm not wrong. This is old as much as me. And I had this guitar um, used, of course I bought that this second hand, and I, I didn't buy, buy that. My father bought that, because I really uh, you know, wanted to play electric guitar. Uh-huh. Uh, and that was, yeah, that was because I, you know, had listened to electric guitar for the very first time uh, on the Kiss song Love Gun, which was pretty much what brought me uh, into rock and roll music. Technically, I had been listening to a lot of electric guitars because I've always uh, been a great fan of the, the Blues Brothers movie. Oh, yeah, uh, I watched totally. that. Yeah, I, w- <laughs> I watched that like... Uh, you know, I used to watch that like 10 times a day, all days when I was a kid. And uh, also listened to the vinyl, actually. And uh, so I loved that. Of course, they were using uh, electric guitars, you know, on Sweet Home Chicago. But that kind of riffing in Love Gun was really what uh, drew me into rock and roll music. Um, it was pretty much, you know, something like coming, you know, from hell to me, you know. My ears, mm-hmm. yeah. So I said, I, I want to, 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 to know what this actually producing that kind of sound. Okay, so uh, this was not prepared at all, but this was actually my first pedal. Uh, death metal. I, death metal by Digital Overdrive. And uh, this was, of course, the, I, I mean, I forced my father to actually buy this. I, I mean, of course, I wanted this only because of the looks, and only because of the fact that it really looked like the meanest pedal, you mm-hmm. know? Of course. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it also had got this guy, you know, rest in peace, guts, pain, and scream, <laughs> you know. Pretty That's classic. Gonna, you know? Of course, yeah. It's going to draw you in, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the funny thing is that I was using this with um, uh, like a sort of... Um, I'm sorry, because being Italian, maybe the terms are different. Uh, with a combo, yeah. with a mm-hmm. Celestion, Celestion speaker inside. It was sounding pretty much like a Fender, but it was the, the brand was custom with the K. Oh, yeah. I know uh, exactly what you're yeah. talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, have got, I still have got that, but in another room there. And I use uh, this pedal in combination with that one, with uh, this guitar. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, to me, I mean, the sound, and because I wasn't able to set that up, was shit, of course. But, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I, I was the happiest person alive. And, uh, yeah, I started playing music. And then, of course, yeah, I, I'm waiting for other questions because I don't want to anticipate you about anything, you know. Oh, go ahead. No, I, I love it. <laughs> Take me through the journey. I love I love this. This is fantastic. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, while, uh, okay, okay, no, this is very important because while, uh, yeah, I still have got there, yeah, Double Platinum by Kiss, which which was actually a best of album. So not technically uh, a proper album, you know, uh, was my very first album, uh, uh, for what concerns rock and roll music, um, the, I mean, not that, not much time after that, I listened to uh, the album that changed my life and then got me into metal, which was mm-hmm. Something Wild by Children of Bodom. Oh, uh, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, the, the mm-hmm. first song, That Night Warrior, was just, uh, to me, something, I mean, 
I had the same reaction I had with Love Gun, but uh, much more, you know, powerful, much more, you know. There was well, that's a big literally, jump. you know, that's a that's a big, big yeah, jump. big yeah. jump, a big jump, uh, yeah. Because you know, I I remember this very funny thing. I don't know why. I mean, when I was listening to um, Kiss, of course, I started listening to other bands, which were mostly, uh, for example, I remember Euro. I've always been a big fan of Europe, uh, mm-hmm. especially, um, well, I mean, I really loved all the first albums, but actually uh, the first song, the very first single they released, which was In the Future to Come, to me, literally sounded like heavy metal, if you think about it, you know, with the mm-hmm. harmonized guitars going and all that kind of stuff. It was really awesome to me, but I really couldn't stand bands like Guns N' Roses or uh, Poison because, you know, I, I was into Kiss and um, Europe uh, and uh, I, I even started to listen to Yngwie J. Malmsteen as well, some songs. Mm-hmm. I was loving that. But when it came to bands, you know, France suggested me, oh, you should listen to, if you like this, you should listen to this. And they were uh, suggesting Guns N' Roses uh, and... Um, uh, yeah, and poison mostly, which were like hair metal some of sort the of, time, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, but but mostly what I wasn't really fond of was the bluesy parts. I mean, I had been in love with blues. I loved rock and roll, but I didn't like a blues-oriented rock and roll, you know, so to mm-hmm. speak. Somehow, yeah. uh, I I was loving Europe because they were using a lot of you know minor scales or something. You know, they were more on the neoclassical. You know, like together with Malmsteen. Um, and that's also the reason why um, I started listening to rock and roll with Kiss, but I never was a, a big fan of happy songs by Kiss. Right. But yes. if you, yeah, but if you think about it, uh, even their most, uh, how can I say, party song, uh, like, for example, I Was Made For Loving You, they mm-hmm. still have got those kind of sad vibes, if you think about right. it. You know, yeah, totally. yeah, and then I was liking that. I was liking that. I didn't like the uh, party bluesy tag. I, I didn't like that. You know, I mean, I mean, I wasn't probably I wasn't uh, that that happy to to reflect you know happiness on guitar. You know, I was just you know I was loving uh, I mean uh, uh, comedic stuff, uh, funny stuff, but not in music. I don't know how to explain that. By the way, I think I, I, think uh, I get it. Like, you know, you were drawn to like a little darker material, you know, it just, I, I, I understand what you mean. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And even as I said, you know, Kiss have been amazing, have been making, you know, music that could be considered to be party music somehow, you know, by some, I mean, not party, but you know, music that's really easy listening uh, and, uh, but uh, it's different, I, especially Paul Stanley songs are really uh, towards that melancholic side, you know, that I really mm-hmm. appreciate. So um, for that reason, not liking that kind of bluesy stuff, I think that's because someone of my friends made me listen to the wrong song by Iron Maiden. I told them, guys, I don't like Iron Maiden. I can't stand this, this band. <laughs> I didn't like them. And even Judas Priest... Probably they, they made me listen to Living After Midnight, which is a song that nowadays I love. But it was too happy. It was too... I didn't like that. You know, the loaded, the, 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 the loaded... I, I didn't like that. Why, why so happy? So I couldn't stand... But now I absolutely love this band like crazy. But I couldn't stand Iron Maiden and Judas Priest because someone, some friend, you know, made me listen to... The right song, the wrong song in the wrong moment, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I always um, stood away from metal because I thought everything was sounding like Iron Maiden and uh, Judas Priest. Now you have to understand that, uh, yeah, internet was already a thing, but was not so easy to actually listen to new music, you know. It's, yeah. It, you know. It didn't was like, you know, you had got the algorithm going uh, and suggesting you something new. Or, okay, let's listen to the entire Iron Maiden discography. It was not that easy. I was still into having cassettes or uh, CDs handled by friends, you know. So uh, it wasn't so easy for me. I was just standing aside from metal 
Until one day I was, I mean, this friend of mine made me listen to Something Wild by Children of Bodom, the song Dead Night Warrior. And uh, I went crazy, you know, for that guitar. And, stuff. and I literally spent uh, years uh, trying to achieve that, that sound, actually. Mm-hmm. But uh, without really uh, studying uh, proper technique or stuff like that. Just trying to imitate them. You know, I was, of course, playing Bed of Razors, which uh, has always been the, the, the simplest uh, Children of Bottom song to play, you know, sure. for people that suck. And guitar, of course, you know, like <laughs> like me back then, yeah. And that that was really, you know. But I was playing pretty much uh, all the songs. I mean, I literally learned how to play rhythms, uh, rhythm, rhythmic guitar, uh, listening by Children of Bottom, mm-hmm. listening to Children of Bottom. Sorry, but uh, of course, I was skipping all the the fast solo stuff because for me that was just too much. I was just not able to understand anything. And um, you would asked me, okay, but uh, guitar tabs were already a thing. Okay, but you could actually have studied that. Yes, but I was, I don't know, I was really fascinated by the rhythm, uh, by the rhythmic uh, approach on guitar. I mean, doing all those kind of tight rhythmic rhythms. And this went toe-to-toe with me discovering dark tranquility and Mm -hmm. all, uh, uh, all the... The, the Swedish death metal bands, uh, of course, the Inflames and Dark Tranquility being the first ones, but also, for example, The Crown, um, or, of, of course, At The Gates as well. And um, I remember I spent a whole summer playing uh, day and night to learn uh, The Gallery by Dark Tranquility, from the mm-hmm. first to the last note. For me, it was much more accessible than uh, Children of Bodom uh, solos. But at the same time, that album literally uh, taught me everything I know nowadays about the rhythm, about uh, alternate picking, you know, with uh, all kind of rhythmics, rhythm guitars. So I di- I'm not that kind of metal head that uh, learned rhythm guitar by playing Master of Puppets. So mm-hmm. no, uh, I'm, I'm not that. Maybe I, was, uh, I wasn't that old, probably. I don't know. Probably. I just grew up in a... Yeah, different place. So mm-hmm. that's pretty much the, the the first approach with the guitar. Yeah, absolutely. But then we are st- there's still a lot of years to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> but in, well, that whole time, were you playing the Ibanez into the death metal, into the custom? Like that was the rig for that time frame of your life while you were learning Absolutely, that? yeah, absolutely, yes. I remember I also had a very small uh, Fender combo but mm-hmm. really small, that somehow came out uh, as a promotion from the music store with the pedal. I don't remember, I don't remember exactly the story, but, um, you know, you have to, um, there is something to say about this. Um, I was born and I lived until I was 19 years old uh, in a, um, not in the north of Italy where we are right now, Mm-hmm. But in the south of Italy, in a relatively small town. So, of course, uh, you know, nowadays you have got internet and everything is everywhere. You know, you can order stuff online, uh, listen to reviews. Uh, you can even take the stuff, try it. If you don't like it, you send it back, you know. Right. Um, b- yeah, back in the days, it was really hard to find uh, instruments. And uh, for me, I was not living in a big city like Rome or like Milan, for example, where there were a lot of music in- instrument um, shops. But I was living in a very small place. So, you know, you had got that or that one, and that and that's it, you know. There yep. were a lot of uh, squire guitars and something. But I remember, yeah, I was probably uh, going to be, to end up um, having a squire myself, until I, as I said, saw this uh, randomly, on a, um, you would say like, a, it's not a pawn shop. It's like a, a fair, like with people uh, moving. Like a, like with, a flea uh, market yeah. type of thing? Yeah, or garage sale? Yeah, exactly, <clears throat> exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. I bought that uh, uh, secondhand. I remember I just saw that and, and it just um, grabbed my attention for the looks. Uh, it was just 
amazing to me. And um, I had tried some guitars from some of my friends before actually having one. And when I asked the, the, the guy to try it, it sounded really, uh, I mean, it was really smooth on my hands. It was very light. And I've also always had very small hands, actually. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, they, I mean, not, <laughs> not monster-like small, but uh, regular small. <laughs> you know. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not like a take and, the uh, strong hand child small, like, <laughs> eh. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. <laughs> exactly. No, no. Not like that. I mean, regular small hands. So yeah. this uh, was extremely thin and also extremely small. It, it's also... I mean, everything is really uh, short. Also, the, the 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 scale, the radius, and everything. So this was really fitting my hands because I've been trying some Fender Stratocasters, some Telecasters as well. But I, I mean, I wasn't able to play those. They they were just too big for me. Um, and of course, um, any kind of uh, Les Paul kind of guitar was just too heavy for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was. I've always been the, the the skinniest guy in the class, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. I was yep. really, yeah. So small hands and skinny, so you cannot play uh, a Gibson, you know. No, at least a Les Paul. So, yeah, I, I saw that guitar and I just uh, tried that. I begged my father to buy it to me. It, it was really cheap, if I'm not wrong. I mean, uh, it was the equivalent of uh, $150 nowadays, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was really cheap uh, already back then. And um, yeah, this was my rig. Uh, but uh, again, the rig was there just because I found this stuff there. Uh, because right. in the shops, I wouldn't have been able to have something at least. I mean, I, I could have some stuff ordered, but I couldn't try that. You know, it's all like that. Well, also, the that age, you, do you even know what you want? right? To, to have it ordered. Like, I don't know. I've yeah, never, abs- never done this absolutely. before. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That would, that, have yeah. been, that would have been just no sense, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I ended up having what uh, the, the marker had to offer, you know, so to speak, uh, including the, the custom, yeah, the, the amplifier. And yeah, I've been uh, playing that stuff uh, until very late. Then I had... Uh, I. I still have all my pedals, but uh, now that one is in a, um, is actually in a bag there. If you want to see, but it's just a regular uh, Super Overdrive, my boss. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. yep. Yeah, which happens to be probably my favorite pedal, together with this one. But we are going to talk about this uh, maybe in a in a little. Uh, all right. Cool. I love a wrap. Yeah. I love it. Mm-hmm. I, I absolutely love it. And um, yeah, I, I've been basically um, started uh, playing and trying to understand what pedals could offer, uh, of course, combined to my custom amplifier, until I started uh, using an actual... Um, a, I don't know how you pronounce that, uh, NGL. Oh, like, yeah, uh, I think it's angle, I think. Angle. Okay, we yeah, say angle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it was an angle fireball, 50. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. it. Yeah. I absolutely loved that amp. I still have got that amp, not here, but in a town I've been living for years because I'm, I'm going on with the story and I'm, I'm going to yeah, yeah. tell you everything. Uh, by the way, I pretty much um, inherited that amp, uh, meaning that that was by a guy that was about to leave and uh, for university stuff like that, never wanted to play guitar anymore. You know, that kind of, you know, those kind of legendary stories that everybody want to happen, you know? Right. Uh, like, ah, just take it. I'm done with it. Yeah. Like Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that was <laughs> also the kind of another guitar that I'm showing in a, in a while, in a little. By the way, I have got all my guitars here incidentally but just because Perfect. this is my my home studio yeah mm-hmm. uh so what what happened was um 
I played that and I played Dark Tranquility mostly and all that kind of, uh, yeah, that melodic death metal stuff. I was also very much into My Dying Bride, for example, and all those kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, uh, also, uh, as soon as I saw the logo on your t shirt, I uh, mistook that for the My Dying Bride logo, but it's not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I totally understand. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very intentional. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, okay, 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 perfect. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, yeah I was, uh, I mean, pretty much into uh, maybe more extreme uh, genres, but uh, I mean, people are defining them extreme. We can talk about, you know, black metal, but to me, they're not that extreme because I was always into the most atmospheric and melodic uh, part of, uh, of black metal, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Mm, now, before going on uh, with the gear, uh, as I said to you, uh, as soon as I was discovering Children of Bodom, I was trying to play them, but I was uh, realized I was not able to, to, to play their solos. Uh, sure. As I was discovering new music, I just ended up starting uh, writing music. And um, what happened was just that I started loving composing so much that I completely um, forgot the, um, the study approach to guitar. I mean, mm, I knew, I don't know why and when and exactly how, but I knew that what I was appreciating in people like Alexi Laio, but also in Paul Stanley, and also in Joy Tempest from Europe, for example, and also from Malmsteen, which was, of course, a, a hell of a guitar player, was mostly their songwriting skills. Because what I was really appreciating of them was the beautiful songs they were making, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I ended up, you know, I had got friends that were... Oh, I mean, that much into virtuoso guitar players. Everybody, you know, yeah, okay, let's listen to Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, uh, all of them, you know. Uh, but when I was listening, for example, uh, at a, you know, Symphony X song, for example, mm -hmm. um, I was just appreciating the, the melody that was so, so outstanding and beautiful to me. Of course, I was appreciating the technique, but I was just not that much interested. But that kind of, uh, I mean, I, uh, this may sound uh, bad, but I didn't care about that. I mean, I care no, more about I, melodic taste. I, I f you know? I'm kind of the same way. Like, I'm really not that interested. I mean, it's impressive and it's cool and I wish I could do it. But I'm not... What drew me to guitar wasn't Shreddy McShredderson just like... I, I did, like, yeah, it's cool. But I, I never even tried to do it. Um... I was more into like, how is the riff constructed? What is the what is the song making me kind of feel, you know? And some of the acrobatic, like very technical stuff, I just didn't I didn't really care about it that much. Yeah, sometimes it fits the song and it and it works, but really, um, if it doesn't fit the song, I I I don't even want it in there, you know? Absolutely, I, I, I want, absolutely. I want to see the the song. I want, or hear the song. I want to know how it's constructed, and that's much more interesting. I totally resonate with what you're saying. Definitely, definitely. If you think about, you know, uh, Petrucci, for example, I was really amazed by the solo in uh, uh, A Fortune in Lies, uh, mm -hmm. the, the beginning part. You know, that was so beautiful. But it was beautiful because it was sounding beautiful, not because yes. it was hard to play, you know. Uh, and also the most memorable solos of Petrucci still remain Another Day or Pull Me Under, you know, which are, of course, are technical, but rely on the melody side. You know, I was yes. never really into, yeah, you know, into that kind of stuff. So, um, mm, I, as I said, I started writing music. I started writing riffs uh, and melodies. Uh, and also, of course, appreciating bands that uh, didn't have virtuoso musicians at all, you know, like, for example, I don't know, uh, like Amorphis, for example. Amorphis were playing mm -hmm. very basic and simple riffs, but beautiful, amazing, you know. Uh, Taste from Thousand Lake, that, that, that was just an incredible album, you know. Um, 
Or maybe I started appreciating rhythms a lot because, for example, I've always been into uh, black metal. So uh, my favorite has always been Immortal and Abath mm-hmm. as well now and Satyricon. And I was really, I mean, those songs were all rhythm, but they were so fast. And I mean, I was really intrigued by also that kind of of playing. And um, so I ended up writing songs uh, mostly. Then I, uh, basically when I was 19, I changed the, uh, city and I moved uh, to, uh, Torino, which is a town in the North, uh, West of Italy, actually, where Juventus comes from the, the football team, you know, I don't know. I'm not into football, but everybody knows, uh, uh, Juventus and uh, Cristiano Ronaldo and all this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and by the way, I moved there, and there I inherited, as I said, the uh, Ang- Angle Fireball. Uh, mm-hmm. And I started playing that thing alone uh, or combined with the Super Overdrive. Uh, there I had another life changing experience, which was actually uh, discovering Richie Cotson. Oh, uh, yeah, that'll do it. Yeah. Richie Cotson, and also with that, I started um, uh, l- discovering a lot more things. For example, I I discovered that uh, there was this awesome bass player in Deep Purple called Glenn Hughes, and that he made an awesome uh, project with... Uh, with one... I mean, uh, my favorite drummer back then, Chad Smith, which mm-hmm. still is one of my favorites from that Red Hot Chili Peppers and Dave Navarro, uh, yep. which was Soul Mover. So I started leaning into that kind of stuff and I uh, started singing a lot more. Um, and I, yeah, I ended up, uh, you know, being uh, exactly um, more the Paul Stanley kind of character rather than the Ace Frehley kind of character, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, writing songs, uh, using my guitar just because I had to uh, go along with my melodies, with my vocal melodies. So guitar, to me, became like a a tool, so to speak, um, to just write songs and to just sing along. Uh, Back then, uh, let's make a quick, uh, if I can. Yes, Um, please. um, Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's make a quick uh, uh, jump forward. Uh, I started... Fr- first thing I did, um, I had this guitar, which is still an Ibanez, still secondhand. And I bought this uh, just because, um, uh, on, how can I say, on parallel, like, uh, I started playing also um melodic death metal stuff uh, on a mm-hmm. more uh, se- with a more you know serious approach so this guitar uh, isn't uh, born as a baritone guitar you call that bass guitar probably i don't know a baritone uh, i play a lot of baritone so yeah okay baritone so mm-hmm. but uh we changed this uh, into that i mean uh, this this is a low b and um, this is tuned pretty much like uh, all, almost all the In Flames albums. And yeah. uh, it, I started so playing. Is it, B, is it B to B? Like it's down yeah, exactly. To that. Standard okay, cool, tuning, yeah. standard tuning B to B. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, and this uh, of course was you know because uh, of course this one was very thin. It, of course, it was very you know like eighty sounding. You know. Yeah. Uh, I also started you know recording something so. This was, uh, you know, more fitting, but still, you know, classic looking. I mean, not because I was not into. Uh, I've never been into those kind of guitars, like, uh, like uh, LTD Eclipse, uh, with all those kind of uh, black uh, stuff. There, you know, I was more mm-hmm. into maybe colorful, more classic stuff. You know, also because I've, I've, I have always been attracted by the Fender. Um, word yeah yeah uh 
Yeah. What, what model was that one? I, did, I couldn't see the headstock very well. This either. is the Z something. This is the WZ, okay. if I'm not wrong. And this was also used by um, Marty Friedman for a while. He had mm-hmm. got like a purple one. And this is, I, this is not, I mean, uh, my cup of tea, but uh, this was also, I mean, the stained guitar player. Uh, band oh, from the US, new right. metal. I've got this. Mm-hmm. So this is a pretty bassy, uh, bassy sound guitar. Yeah, it's very mm-hmm. low and uh, it, it it has actually an awesome sound. It also plays beautiful. Uh, and this is pretty much my baritone guitar. I even recorded some of the uh, latest Frozen Crown albums with this before switching mm-hmm. to a seven string. But that's a long story again. So uh, I started writing music and uh, uh, started um, writing, I mean, uh, of course, yeah, playing uh, melodic death metal, but also uh, playing, um, I could say, hard rock music, rock blues yeah. kind of. Um, and I um, founded this band called Be The Wolf. Now, uh, Be The Wolf... Uh, is a band that was really uh, important for the uh, creation of a Frozen Crown as well. So this mm-hmm. is uh, one of the albums, the Japanese version. Oh, cool. uh, and uh, yeah, and if you see this, uh, I swear I, I didn't made up this I, for the interview. <laughs> this I was is going to say I I love that all this stuff is just here. That's fantastic. This no, yeah, but because mm-hmm. yeah, this is my. I mean. Every single action figure here was a gift Mm -hmm. by Japanese fans, actually. Uh, I have got a ton also there over, but yeah, I cannot uh, show that right now. So Mm -hmm. uh, all action figures here are gifts from Japanese fans. uh, And also this is a gift. uh, This comes from Burn magazine. Um, And uh, actually this one is the... Uh, readers uh, pop poll of 2015 for mm-hmm. Be the Wolf, yeah, by Burn Magazine. Burn Magazine is the uh, biggest uh, rock and roll heavy metal uh, magazine in Japan. Oh, cool! Uh, Very cool. Yeah, and we we had been uh, there because I had I got that uh, handle uh, personally. Uh, we played in Japan in 2015 with that band called Be the Wolf. Um, we made like, uh, uh, four albums. Yeah. (laughs) And, um, uh, yeah, we pretty much went very serious, uh, on that. Uh, so of course I was using my fireball, but for, uh, the recording sessions of our first album, I, uh, together with my, um, producer, which is still nowadays the same guy. Um, cool. we, uh, tried several pedals and several stuff. And then, uh, uh, I just fell in love with this, uh, combined with my fireball and, mm-hmm. um, this, the super overdrive and the fireball. And then yeah. I, for the, uh, also... for the audio folks, he's holding a rat right now. He went back to the yeah, rat. rat. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a so-called Rat 2 uh, for the mm-hmm. for the geeks uh, among yes. you. Yeah, which, which yeah, is most uh, of us. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also this one, which is uh, I mean, looks very uh, beaten up, so very cool because it looks very vintage. It actually I bought this brand new, but just <laughs> I just this yeah I just destroyed this because I was very uh, uncaring of my stuff. Yeah, this. Was pretty much uh, this th- um, this uh, MXR Phase 90, of course, uh, for some songs. This uh, Procorat and uh, my Super Overdrive by Boss, and that all was into it. The, to get... All into the angle. All into the angle, and yeah. all this with uh, this, uh, of course, tuner. Uh, yep. You can actually uh, listen to this sound in the first two Be The Wolf albums. So if you are interested in that, uh, you can search for the band Be The Wolf. Uh, the mm-hmm. albums are uh, Imago, uh, which is Latin, and Rouge, like red in French. Mm-hmm. So that's it. Um, 
by the way, uh, by being in Japan, ah, sorry, I didn't show you the guitar, of course. Oh, yes, let's see that, yes. Yeah, I ended up, you know, since, wait, so, uh, since this guitar was, of course, uh, heavy metal, hard rock, how can I explain mm -hmm. that, yeah. Yep. Uh, and this other guitar was now like a bass guitar, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to play heavier stuff. But that was more, mm -hmm. you know, for, for fun, mostly. Yep. I uh, grabbed this one, this uh, Fender Cabronita Oh, Telecaster. yeah. Love that. Love yeah. the Cabronitas. Yes. Yes. And this is also because I was in love with this kind of uh, pickups, which I discover yep. playing a Gretsch, a Gretsch yep. Electromatic, which I absolutely loved and also used in a couple of videos and also in the recording of the first Beatle Wolf album. But then I wanted this guitar. This was absolutely angrier than the Gretsch. Sure. And much more, I mean, people say this is not comfortable because it's not uh, shaped, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but to me, it was really comfortable, actually. And also, mm, I have to say, and this goes for all my newest guitars, um, I have small hands, but yep. uh, but I'm, I don't like very thin um, necks. For example, the Wizard Neck by Ibanez, to me, is extremely uncomfortable. I don't know mm -hmm. how to explain that, but it's really uncomfortable. This has got no, I'm quite a soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, this has, has got quite a sort of C, uh, of C um, shape. How do you say that? Sorry for the, yeah. you know, because now because uh, sorry, uh, I have to say this uh, uh, to all the listeners. Uh, please forgive me because, of course, being Italian, we have got so many different terms for every single part of this, you know. Sure, of course. I, that, you know, yeah. sometimes, you know, I, I'm not really used to that, you know, so sorry. Uh, You're so, good, um, no worries. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this guitar, I mean, it's, I'm really in love with this and uh, I'm using this in the studio still today. And also I use this guitar to record. This is really funny. Most of the Frozen Crown albums uh, until the fourth one. Really? Yeah. yeah. This is uh, yeah guitar with uh, this kind of you know filter tron pickups. I recorded uh, pretty much power metal stuff. Yeah, that's absolutely. fantastic. I love that. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and you know why? You know why? Only because it was the most comfortable neck, and mm -hmm. only because. Uh, Aside from that, uh, our producer was like, uh, listen, all your guitars really suck, except for this. Because this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he, 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 he said that this was having, in the recording, much more shades, much more uh, harmoni har uh, harmonics. Uh, it was richer sounding. Yeah. I don't know mm -hmm. how to explain. Yeah. If you think about well, it, I mean, this, is, this is, yeah. It, I mean. it makes sense to me. I I love like traditional humbuckers and high output stuff for metal, but I have this baritone. Uh, it's, it's like a 28 inch scale baritone that's tuned yeah. B to B or sometimes drop A. And it has gold foil, single coils in it. And it sounds huge. It's made by Grez Guitars in California. Yes. And it sounds enormous through high gain amplifiers. So like... He didn't Absolutely. design the, the guitar to play that kind of music at all, but I use it for heavy stuff all the time. So I love non-traditional, quote unquote, uses for, you know, for or yeah, actually, you know, more, tra more traditional yeah. guitars in heavy music. I'm all like, I'm so about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. That's I mean, I also find that cool. And uh, I, I also think that, uh, of course, OK, now. I'm stopping. I'm. I'm uh, just making a shop, a short uh, stop with the story because I really sure. want to tell this. Uh, I recorded uh, pretty much fifteen albums uh, in uh, eight years or something, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe nine years. I don't remember. Uh, but I can tell you that, uh, of course, um, recording in the studio 
uh, is a totally different thing than um, playing live. And this, you, you may tell me, yeah, but that's obvious. I mean, that's not that obvious because I've got a lot of people that, uh, of course, are great guitar players, really skilled, really talented, playing extremely well on live uh, uh, environment. But then they play in the studio and they are, you know, they're getting all the noise coming out. Uh, they're not stopping. They're not muting the, the, the strings. Or maybe simply they don't have the, 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 that kind of, I mean, that kind of attitude they have live. They are amazing. They just cannot reproduce that when they are in the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, mm -hmm. that's something extremely uh, specific that you can just know if you record a lot of stuff. Uh, I can say that I suck live totally, totally. I'm not. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, mass uh, noise, uh, screaming, shouting, uh, uh, talking with people, jumping around, and of course, I'm very sloppy and messy. But uh, of course, um, I've always uh, took uh, studio recordings very seriously, and I, I, I don't know. I, I think. All this to say that having the right guitar for you, the one you are most comfortable with, is the best thing to do. Because if you're trying that uh, small sweep picking, as I said, I'm not that technical, but you know, some alternate, uh, alternate picking scale, uh, whatever. If you're playing that lick, and that lick is uh, uh, oh, better hi. here. Oh, hi there. Hey. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're, you're early. Oh, sorry, but yeah. hi, how's everything <laughs> we're, going? We're recording another podcast right now. Oh, good. Well, give him my best, whoever yeah. it is. Yeah, I'm I got you on the schedule for 1 p.m. Yeah. So okay. are you going to call me or something? Or is just, my phone? Just, just log into this app at, at 1 p.m. Pacific. Isn't it logged in already? I don't know shit about this, so get ready for a, a you know. Okay, well, 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 we'll talk in a couple hours. How about I'm okay. leaving. In, okay. Yeah. But in a couple of minutes, right? One o'clock, right? One o'clock my time. I'm Pacific. Oh, that yeah. was not clear. So oh, I see. Three, so it's three o'clock my time or that, four o'clock? I'm not sure where you're at. So I'm in New York. We, we're, rec we're recording now. I'm going to let the listeners know what happened. We, I've got two podcasts today. Uh, later in a, in a few hours, I'm recording one with, with Mike Stern, legendary you know jazz guitarist. Uh, and it uh, seems like he was testing the connection and uh, hopped into our conversation, which has never happened before. This is a, this is a new thing. Um, so sorry, Federico for the interruption no, no, no here, but, but yeah, no problem. good times. Yeah. Well, was just telling about the importance of having a guitar you're comfortable with to record yes. more than that guitar, having also the technical specs fitting your specific uh, 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 genre. Uh, of course, the best thing would be to have a guitar that technically fits all your needs and is also the most comfortable you have. But of course, mm -hmm. I was not a billionaire. I just had those guitars. And uh, it was when I was, you know, about to record the album, it was too late, you know, to just think about taking a new guitar, you know, or, or whatever. I just used this, you know. Uh, by the way, um, this guitar uh, was uh, played with the Angle Fireball, Procorat, and uh, uh, Super Overdrive, and uh, yeah, the Face 90 um, to play uh, some sort of, uh, um, how can I say, hard rock, bluesy kind of stuff. There was also a lot of clean guitars going and there. But as I said, um, so what happened? I went to Japan uh, several times with this band called Be The Wolf. But then I was back to Italy all the time. Uh, and I was uh, extremely sad because, uh, you know, Italian situation for music really sucks. Uh, oh, yeah. So bad. Yeah, so bad. Mm -hmm. It's really shit, total shit. Uh, it's literally a mafia, you know. People just, uh, you know, if there is a festival... People playing there is not people that have got numbers or that deserves that. It's just a friend of someone. It's just a brother of someone, or just a promoter own band. Uh, right. And okay. of course, yeah. yeah. And of course, uh, uh, all the Italian metal heads cannot stand bands made by young people. And as 
at the same time bands where there are women inside. So of course, oh. uh, yeah. So of course, Frozen Tra- Fro- Frozen Crown is the main target by uh, from by those person. Oh, um, of course, luckily for us, uh, they count like you know nothing. They are like I don't know twenty people, thirty people actually hating on us uh, compared with the whole uh, you know world market because we sell you know worldwide and Italy is anyway less than five percent of our sales. So it's really factors nothing for us anyway mm-hmm. by the way with before even making a, a metal band i was with this band be the wolf we were basically you know uh, touring japan um you know uh, we were experiencing like uh, you know uh, people coming to take us with taxis and uh, bringing us to the best hotels ever uh, fabulous dinners uh, tons of fans uh, tons of meet and greets, signing sessions with fans, uh, a full uh, packed shows. Everything was awesome. We even have been on the national TV on, in Japan several times and also on several national radios and stuff. But I couldn't manage to make this band work outside of Japan. And that was really frustrating for me, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I said, well, what's the best thing to do? To move to Japan, that's obvious, of course. I should just move to Japan. So how can you move to Japan if you don't have a work there? Simple as that. I went to the record label, Marquis Avalon, and said, I mean, not technically, guys, please give me a job. It was not like that. (laughs) But I was like, hey, guys, can I maybe write some songs for you? I mean, for other artists or maybe for some, I don't know, project you have got in mind or maybe whatever Mm -hmm. they were absolutely uh i I gotta say they turn uh, and they say no wait a second you should absolutely do this but you should make a a solo project because with the fans of uh, this band with the wolf we are definitely going to sell at least this amount of copies so we're mm-hmm. going to be covered. That's going to be a success for sure. So uh, this label, Avalon Marquis Avalon, which is still our label nowadays in Japan, was actually having Sonata Artica and the Children of Bodom and a lot of uh, power metal oriented stuff somehow. So they were working really well in the power metal market. At the same time, I've always been, I had always been very attracted by metal as i said so i said okay i should make this uh project uh, something between children of bottom and sonata artica so to speak you know and angra also back then i remember was big fan of um so i recorded three songs where i was singing on them and they were really uh, happy with those those songs were actually the first uh, uh, songs the, uh, on the first Frozen Crown album. I cannot find it here, but you can trust me. Yeah. By the way, uh, <laughs> it was the, <laughs> yeah, it was a fail no more to the if if there's some Frozen Crown fan here, they were fail no more to Infinity and Netherstorm. So Netherstorm was a really death metal, melodic death metal kind of song where I was also growling. Uh, Fail No More was a classic power metal song. And I had got this song, like, to Infinity, which was more melodic. So uh, for the demo, I was, like, uh, you know, thinking, oh, I would love to have a female singer here. Also because the idea for that song came from one song I really love, which is Fallout by Devin Townsend. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, there is, sorry for bad pronunciation, Anneke from the gathering. Anneke. Mm-hmm. Sorry, uh, my pronunciation really sucks. It's Anneke okay. or whatever. No sorry. Yeah. yeah. Forgive me, Anneke. Or, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, by the way, that song, Fallout by Devin Townsend, was amazing. Uh, I said, uh, yeah, look, you know, guys, uh, what if we have a female singer on this album? And Japanese guys were like, uh, okay, 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 but just keep her a guest because 
your fans are not going to like the fact that someone else is singing at your place, you know. Okay. Uh, and also, they explained me that somehow Japanese market was not that fond of female singers somehow stealing the place to male singers somehow. You know, that was pretty much kind of a, a strange thing going. Uh, so I said, hey, I don't know, she's just going to be a guest. So I searched for uh, some singers here in Italy. There were eight of them. Uh, all of them were singing uh, with, um, you say, operatic, correct? Vocals. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, yep. like, yeah. And uh, I wasn't really a fan of that. Then I found this singer, uh, this blonde singer called uh, Jada Etro, or Jade, uh, the current Frozen Crown singer. And I uh, sent her the songs. And she sang that song with uh, a rock, more rock uh, attitude. But she, she mm-hmm. was mostly sounding like Timo Cotipelto by Stradivarius. She was more sung, singing, you know, we, we said singing like a man, but uh, nowadays that's something that you cannot, you can't tell anymore, you know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. She was, you know, I know what you mean, though. She, was, uh, she had a more aggressive sound. To her voice. Yeah, more to... aggressive sound. I mean, singing like a man, mm. I mean, in that specific moment uh, means that, you know, in metal, there were not many singers, many female singers that were singing that way. All of them in metal, I mean, most of them in metal were singing operatic, you know. Uh, yes. So I I sent the Japanese label mm. these demos and they were really happy. They say, okay, just let uh, produce this, this solo album, this Federico Mondelli solo album. Um... And I was, okay, cool. I came back to Italy uh, talking with the uh, current uh, label because, yes, we were on a Japanese label for the Japanese market, but we also Mm -hmm. had a label in Italy, which was Scarlet Records. I talked with a guy about this whole thing. He listened to the song. He said, oh, my God, these songs are amazing. You are a madman if you are making this only happen to Japan. You should absolutely do this with me <laughs> and we are going to make this also go in, in Europe and you are going to... Um, this this is going to work in Europe. Um, so, uh, randomly, I don't know how that came out, but I just told uh, Jada to sing my parts she happened to sing also my parts, and uh, the song sounded amazing. We were both just in love with that. Uh, so we decided that Jade had to be our lead singer. And that also came uh, uh, side by side with the fact that I was really, 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 really enjoying to have a guitar in my hands and sing on stage. But I wasn't really fond of all that kind of attention on me uh-huh. so, right so I, I said i was i i have to be a backing vocalist guitar player that that i mean i just found my you know like uh when you see that like oh, 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 you know. <laughs> right yeah but i had got a i had a vision you know i had to be a backup singer that occasion, occasionally sings leads guitar player that was just my my way, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, yeah, the, 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 the one that writes all the songs and stuff like that. Um, so we basically uh, made this album as a solo project again. So, I mean, I recorded all the stuff myself, uh, everything. And she sang her own parts. Uh, we took uh, three people that uh, actually served as uh, live members somehow, you know. And uh, we started that band, and that worked really well because we made our first million uh, on YouTube uh, nice. with the first video. Yeah, with the first video. It was really amazing. There was a lot of interest in the band back then. And uh, we, uh, what happened was exactly what I had planned. And I could stay hours here to talk about this. Uh, it concerns the, the live um environment uh so uh a lot of people i knew and all of us also of my age you know i got this kind of mindset you have to play live to play live 
Right. I don't know if you if you know what I mean. I you have to play live a lot. I mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to play live a lot if you want to play live. But I was with my previous band, with my rock band, uh, Be The Wolf, I was noticing that we had been playing a lot around. We even made a show opening for uh, the Winery Dogs, uh, Portnoy and uh, uh, Sheehan and uh, Richie Cotson as well. We mm -hmm. played a lot. We had been on the... I'm showing you this because I have got everything here. Uh, what is this? Yeah. I have to show this to you. We had been on uh, Rolling Stone, Italy, with nice. this naked, half naked Bruce Springsteen, <laughs> with, with this huge two page photo. Oh, wow. And this is, yeah, this is me. And this says, Be the Wolf. And this says, like, this says, okay, I translate. This says, Hey, Italian, this band is extremely famous in Japan and you should check them because in Japan they are like celebrities. They're talking uh, about them on radio shows and stuff. You should meet them. And uh, so we have got a lot of uh, boost also from media, from radios and stuff. But uh, that wasn't bringing anywhere, you know, uh, mm -hmm. because, yeah, we were, we were playing, we were playing, but... Uh, of course, being Italian, people are not into uh, that kind of music. I also sang in English as well. And Italians love uh, music sung in, in Italian, of course. Of course. Of uh, course. So uh, for that reason, the, the, yeah, for that reason, there was no way for us to escalate, you know, to, to play in Italy, get bigger, then maybe going to play sometimes in Switzerland, maybe going to play sometimes in Germany and then get, getting bigger and bigger. No way, no way. Of course, everybody was um, telling us, okay, you should pay us uh, 20,000 euros to uh, open for this band on tour, for example. They were selling mm -hmm. uh, um, buy on um, or a pay to play kind of stuff. Yeah. And I, but I was not into that. And also, I didn't have money for that anyway. Um, so, while making this band, uh, with this new band called Frozen Crown, I was like, okay, now, this time, I am not going to do the same mistake. Uh, and that's also the reason, yeah, sorry, I have to take it. That's also the reason why the first song on the album is called Fail No More. So wait a second. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm just taking this so I can... Uh, uh, show you the whole thing so uh this was the first frozen crown album and mm -hmm. uh first song first song was called uh, uh, fail no more which was actually something i was telling to myself you know uh you have to do the right thing now so instead instead of uh trying to get the attention of promoters and uh booking agent and stuff why don't i just create something that gets big online like maybe making a video a music video that works well because if that works well someone is going to be interested in that music someone is going to be willing to pay a ticket to see that band so mm -hmm. i'm going to be interesting for the market and that's exactly what happened with Frozen Crown, because with this album, uh, first single, Kings, actually, uh, of course, I, I took care of the, the album cover, the, the video of everything. And that video actually scored the first million. And we, <laughs> we never rehearsed before. Oh. <laughs> and we, yeah, never. And we were uh, invited to make a European tour. Um, and uh, for, before that, a Spanish tour only. Uh, so we went basically on tour, uh, rehearsing for the first time, mostly, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And uh, uh, before I go on, I'm showing you, uh, of course, now, I had got this one, which was, of yep. course, pretty cool. I recorded the, uh, the Frozen Crown album with that. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, not the really made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, the Cabernet, but mm -hmm. not really made for metal. 
I have got my old uh, white Ibanez, but the, you know, I still needed maybe a backup or something. Then you will never <laughs> believe that. Never, never. But you, I have my friend to to be uh, can, that can can come here to um, to 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 witness. This is real. Okay. Just a second. Just a second. Oh my god! Before I break something. Oh. So <laughs> this guitar. Mm -hmm. So this is we got, the. We got a Jackson here. Yeah. Yeah, we got a Jackson, of course, uh, and of course it's not it's not the Alexi Lyo model, but to me it was of course uh, awesome as his own. Uh, but uh, the fact is, this guitar was this uh, made in Japan, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. This guitar was actually <laughs> another thing that came to me, and I never asked for. I mean. Uh, <laughs> literally, there was this friend uh, again, another one, not the one mm -hmm. of the An Angle Fireball. There was this friend moving to Australia uh, to work there, so he left uh, a house filled with guitars, and he really? told that yeah, he told that mm -hmm. to my friend, which was playing with me uh, back then in, in in the Be the Wolf band, yeah, the mm -hmm. rock band. Um, and he said, "Go there and just take them." So I what? happened to be with yeah, I happened to be with with this friend of mine. We went there, and he had really, really much more expensive guitars than these, and much more. Uh, um, how can I say? Like, uh, how can I say? Not only much pricier, but also finest, maybe in in the oh yeah yeah like manufacturer really stuff. Fancy, fancy high end. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. Also, also, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, uh, and also an acoustic one, a Martin acoustic guitar. You know, a lot of stuff. Uh, so this friend of mine was like, "Oh my god!" And it was having so many guitars to, to bring home that he just saw that uh, Jackson Randy wrote that and said, "Well, I know you are always been an Alexi Lyo fan, so just take that." And I said, "No, why?" He said, "Yeah, just take that." I, I can't stand guitars with uh, this kind of shape. You know, I'm not comfortable playing that. So just stay there. Yeah. I would say, no, what, no way. I mean, and uh, yeah, he gifted this to me pretty much. That's amazing. So I tell, you know, yeah. So uh, Francesco, if you're looking at us, thanks again. You know, <laughs> he's, a, he's a buddy. He's even worked uh, as a sound guy for Frozen Crown sometimes. Yeah. He's That's a, cool. Still a friend. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and um, by the way, uh, I brought this one on tour mm -hmm. uh, the first time. Yeah, together with my Ibanez as well. Also because I was, uh, I, yeah, I was playing uh, in two different tunings and I was not using a drop or a pedal board to switch. So mm. this was um, tuned uh, in a D standard and uh, mm -hmm. the Ibanez was tuned in B, in a, sorry, in E standard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I basically uh, I got this set up and uh, uh, while I was using my angle fireball still uh, when I mean, as I said we went from uh, zero to having a tour uh, in a matter of uh, weeks, so to speak you know, that's amazing uh, yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. but uh, the fact is, of course um of course, uh, um, how can I say, uh, expenses for, for, for touring, of course, were really, uh, you know, big. So having a, a cabinet and a head uh, and uh, you call that head, right? Yep, yeah, yep, sorry. yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that was very, uh, like, uh, you know, um, expensive and not practical and stuff like that so maybe uh for example when i went to japan they were borrowing me one for example they were renting mm -hmm. but uh, of course for a tour or something like that i switched and actually the the whole band switched to the infamous uh i don't know if you are into classic amps uh helix line six helix mm -hmm. uh and that's what we are using nowadays uh that's actually uh, what I'm using nowadays with my seven string guitars, I'm getting there in a matter of minutes, but uh, the story pretty much ends here. 
because then mm -hmm. Frozen Crown just made a couple of other um, steps. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, I couldn't stand having, I mean, using the, the Helix. Uh, and that mostly because I couldn't stand using uh, in-ear monitors. Okay. Uh, I mean, with that, we were using uh, a stage that was uh, producing no uh, sound. Mm -hmm. except for the drums, you know. So, of course, I was forced to use the uh, in-ear monitors and also, of course, that. That was making, of course, our playing much better, you know, of course, because if you're able to listen yourself better, you have to deal with that, you know. Uh, but still, I was hating that so much, but I, I eventually ended up, uh, you know, being like, uh, okay, uh, that's what I have to do, you know, to play. Because uh, after that, we released the second album, uh, which was uh, Crowned in Frost, mm -hmm. still recorded with this. The Cabernet. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, and um, and uh, uh, with this album, we, after the first video was released, we were actually written to by Dragon Force. Uh, they actually wrote to me uh, on the email and I thought it was a joke from a friend, you know. was like, mm -hmm. uh, not a joke, like, uh, 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 how can I say, uh, a prank. Yeah, a prank. Like, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. a prank. Uh, but uh, it was, no, no, really, uh, it's me, it's me, you know, uh, it's me, Herman. And uh, yeah, so do you guys want to, to come on tour with us? Then he wrote to me on Instagram from his official uh, account, so that was... And then we uh, toured with Dragon Force. And in that specific moment, I mean, from that specific moment, we, of course, learned the fact that you have to deal with the fact you need to use uh, simulators, amp simulators, unless you are uh, rich enough or you can move. Unless there you're Dragon Force, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and still, still mm -hmm. they're using campers, so... I mean, oh, they're using there you still, go. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, all digital still because, of course, they say yeah, but that that's. Uh, I mean, even if you're rich, uh, what's the point in bringing that? You know, because that's just occupying occupying a lot more space, a lot more. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's heavy. It's not practical. It can be damaged and stuff like that. So uh, all of that and all of our uh, touring and also uh, one shot shows here and there uh where mm -hmm. you know ba basically with a plane and just with that and that go figure i used the big one the big helix for all these years but right now i also bought the small one uh which is even worse i mean in in, in terms of sound i mean but um, uh, it's actually portable and that's mm -hmm something we have to deal with you know by the way uh what happened really is just that i started writing albums and albums and albums and we did some shows and there was the covid so we didn't make shows but we made a lot of videos and sold a lot of albums online um and uh my evolution with frozen crown stepped through this guitar which came actually with the second album. Ooh, uh, that this looks is, great. Yeah, this, yeah. Oh, and this, uh, this sticker here was put here by Herman Lee, by Dragon Force himself. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. And this was, I, I, I so mean, what, ease. What, what, model is, what model is that? Absolutely. This is a Charvel yeah. DK24 mm -hmm. Pro Mod. Got it. Um, it was matte green, matte uh, black, but now mm -hmm. it's uh, and it's also all damaged. And of course, I I really love this because this guitar pretty much did uh, all the Frozen Crown dirty job until last year, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, I played this uh, everywhere, and uh, yeah. I'm not very kind with my gear. I, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, this guitar is just a tool to play. As long as it can play good, it's fine. If it's broken, I don't care. Um, and yeah, this was my companion for uh, pretty much uh, 
five years with uh, Frozen Crown. Um, maybe even six. Uh, until last year, Jackson came to us for a deal. And uh, I actually thought it was some sort of artist prize or something. But instead, it was like they were like, uh, no, we are gifting you uh, guitars. And wow. uh, that's it. Yeah, and that's it. By the way, I don't have my um, Jackson, which is uh, King V, uh, Corey Beaulieu, which is the Trivium guitar player, actually. Mm -hmm. It's actually yeah. a signature, but I chose that because it was uh, extremely uh, cool and white and icy, just like a Frozen Crown guitar should be. And uh, I'm, I'm showing it to you. All right, it's, cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, this photo is very important because this is from our first gig, um, our first gig uh, after Jackson uh, gifted us these guitars. I see. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, so this is mine. This is uh, the blue one of uh, Fabiola, and uh, it's mm -hmm. missing the bass player has got the one that they call the, 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 the Jackson, the Rick and Jackson or something like uh, it's a Jackson oh, bass awesome. that looks, yeah, looks pretty much like Ricky. a Rick and Baker. Yeah, 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 yeah. pretty much, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, this guitar uh, actually is my current one. And uh, um, it differs from all of my other guitars because it has got active pickups uh, uh -huh. and also seven string. Now, why the seven strings? Because, of course, I've been switching between uh, uh, this and uh, the baritone one to record heavier stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I've always been a guy that uh, didn't like very much to change guitars on stage. Uh, and I always wanted to be very practical, you know. So uh, with the seven string guitar, I could play pretty much everything and record pretty much everything uh, in all tunings. And uh, I'm really happy with that. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's really big for my small hands, uh, but, uh, but still it's, uh, I mean, I love it. And, um, by the way, it's, uh, perfect for the kind of music I do with Frozen Crown, you know, uh, I think that doesn't need to be a versatile guitar. That's right. my guitar for Frozen Crown, you know, so that's what it's made for. For example, a guitar I really love, which is also very versatile, is this mm -hmm. Fender Stratocaster. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a Mexican one, and I love this. This is pretty much the counterpart of this. They are um, really similar mm -hmm. uh, for some in, in some ways, but this is really mean and angry. It's very awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. I also love this. Uh, and I use this for studio work and also for some solos on uh, Frozen Crown albums as well. Uh, so this yeah, is... For versatility, like it's hard to beat a, a Strat with a humbucker and two singles. It's like that can cover so much ground, you know. Everything, just, everything, everything, yeah. everything. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. And mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an old guy, so I'm, a, I'm in love with Stratocasters, you know. What can I say? Yeah. I just got my first Strat ever. I've never owned a Strat until two weeks ago, so it's oh uh, I, awesome! I, yeah, I'm, I've been like a Les Paul guy. I love I, and I mean I have a lot of different guitars, but I've always gravitated yeah. kind of towards Gibsons, even though I, I do have some Fenders. But yeah, I got my first Strat, and I can't stop playing it. I, I'm surprised. Yeah, it's, it's so beautiful so to play. To, yeah, Absolutely. I finally got Which... it. I didn't get it, but now I get it. I understand now. I know, I know. Which guitar is that? Uh, which, uh, which fender is that? I mean, so I'll show you here. It's uh, I keep yeah, talking yeah. about it on the internet, so it's um, it's this guy here. Wow, yeah. yeah. So it's pretty classic. This is it's a made in Japan uh, Squire, actually. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah I, yeah. I always said if I get a Strat, I want a black on black or white on white, but preferably black on black. Rosewood fretboard, big seventies headstock. And I thought I would have to shell out for like an actual like 1970s Fender to get all of that stuff. And then yeah, a yeah, friend yeah. of mine owns a shop here locally, posted this. And he's like, yeah, this is one of the made in Japan squires that everybody wants. I was like, oh, it's got the big headstock and black on black and the rosewood. I was like, I'll be right there. 
I'm coming to get it's it. Your, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it was a, such a good deal. But like, even that all aside, I can't stop playing it. I'm, I'm, I've turned over a new leaf as a player. I'm playing the strat all the time now. Never thought I would Absolutely. say Absolutely. Uh, no, well, you know, this is very similar to my story, but I, I don't know if I can tell it to you because maybe, I don't know how much time do we have or something. I think we're, we are actually just over the hour already, so maybe we can talk about it on Patreon if that works for you. Uh, whatever, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Well, dude, we, we, I think we really hit it off here. This is a really, I was really super interested in hearing all of this because you know, everybody's journey is unique and I like hearing how people approach the instrument and how, you know, you're talking about using different things for, and then explaining the purpose. I really enjoyed this conversation quite a bit, but I do have uh, a couple classic questions that I ask everybody to wrap the episode up with. Yes. Um, and before I do that, I like to give the guests a chance to take the stage, plug anything you want to plug Shout out anybody you want to shout out. You know, you're talking to a few thousand people right now and you can say whatever you want. The floor is yours. Well, of course, uh, guys, I'm very happy to be here, actually. And uh, of course, because uh, I'm a real person. I'm a real music fan, metal fan. And I love to talk with real people that actually love music, love instruments. Uh, I love all this and I can see, you know, your passion here, Blake, and uh, I'm so happy to be here. So I hope you guys can enjoy some of my music or maybe part of that. And I hope to be half as interesting as I, as I hope I could be. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really having the time of my life right now because this is uh, literally just a chilled, uh, you know, conversation. How can we talk about it? I mean, how can, how can we define that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. I think yeah, it's just just something uh, absolutely cool, and I also yeah love to talk about all these kind of backstories and stuff because after all, all these small details, you know, the fact you always wanted that kind of Stratocaster and then just now you found it, and all this kind, of, those are things that may be insignificant to other people, but they are ours, you know, they make us who, who we are, you know, unique as musicians. And I think mm -hmm. if I had uh, a different guitar than this and uh, didn't record uh, three metal albums using this, uh, I wouldn't be the same person. I, and my band would be the same, you know. It's mm -hmm. uh, always a matter of your story is a, a, a mixture of elements and everything uh, is worth. So even every single piece of gear, and that's why I'm so happy to be here to talk about, about this with you geeks. Like me. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And we'll, uh, we'll get these two classic questions out of the, out of the way, and then we'll slide over to Patreon. Uh, so the first one, yes. and maybe you might have already answered this. What is your favorite hmm. boss pedal? Oh, my God. Uh, okay. It's a super overdrive. Absolutely. It's a super yeah. overdrive. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. I know... I, I, I was I hesitated because I know that's not considered to be a pedal that can stand alone, so to speak, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, somehow. But I really love the sound of a clean amp, that pedal, and the guitar. I really love that. I jammed for hours just using that pedal in a clean amp and just sounded amazing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that pedal. Yeah, super overdrive. Perfect. Perfect. Now, final question, and this is yeah. very relevant to you because mm. you're Italian. Yeah. What is, your favorite kind, what is your favorite kind of pizza? Oh, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, then I have to tell you also something else about pineapple pizza. All right. Uh, here we go. <laughs> I have got a very, I have got a, a take, a personal take on that. Uh, but my favorite pizza, for how uh, basic and obvious it may be, is a pizza. It's like a margarita with, uh, uh, you call it pepperoni pizza. We call it mm -hmm. pizza with the salami. Salami. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or maybe any kind of sausage. So that's my favorite. And also with gorgonzola cheese. Oh, so, yeah. yeah my perfect. Yeah, so my perfect pizza would be margarita with gorgonzola and sausage. We call it simply 
Salsiccia e Gorgonzola. That sounds <laughs> Play. right up my alley. Yeah. That sounds like exactly what I want. I love that. That sounds great. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, if you want to, to know my take on pineapple pizza. I do. Uh, I do. Okay. I think, first of all, Italian people, me included, are very, 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 uh, you would say, biased, maybe. They are very, mm-hmm. I cannot say, they, they, they also a little hypocritical. If okay. We talk about it. And why? Uh, it's very common habit here in Italy to have fruit with salty stuff. For example, sure. a very popular a very popular dish is uh, prosciutto e melone, which is something really simple, which is yeah. melon and uh, ham, very salty ham. Or for example, we eat a lot of cheese with fruit, with figs uh, or uh, even jam and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. There is even a, a popular um, way of saying, very ancient, which is uh, uh, is uh, al contadino non far sapere quanto è buono il formaggio con le pere. Now I'm translating. It mm-hmm. means uh, don't tell the farmer how good is cheese with pears. Because what does this mean? The farmer, of course, makes cheese and mm-hmm. grows pears. Mm-hmm. And he sells these two ingredients to the market, you know, of course. But if he knew how good they are together, he would eat everything himself and and (laughs) nobody, you know, nobody would have that. That's a way of saying to say how awesome it is for us Italian. Cheese with fruit. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now you want to tell me that, uh, oh no, pineapple pizza sucks. No way. It doesn't suck at all. It's just, (laughs) I mean... You know, we have got pizzas with stuff like, for example, I, I can I say, like uh, um, dried tomatoes, which mm-hmm. are uh, conserved in vinegar to just yeah. give that kind of uh, 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 um, tangy, probably, tangy mm-hmm. taste. Like, I, I would, no, sour. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah. I know what you mean. You know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, we do that here too. Because the... Yeah, because pineapple mm-hmm. is sweet, but not only sweet, it's also acid. How can you tell that, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And we have got a lot of pizzas with uh, acid ingredients that are just the same tasting. I mean, the result, the final result is the same taste of pineapple pizza. Because, uh, of course, if you add something like that with grease, you're going to uh, somehow soften the, the, that fi- kind of heaviness of grease, you know? So mm-hmm. my take is that every Italian, if he was blindfolded, you give him a pineapple pizza and he's going to absolutely enjoy that because that's so <laughs> Italian, so Italian. Yeah. Fruit with, with cheese and ham and whatever, perfect. But no, they have to say, no, shit, no. That, that, that's a... And they are just hypocritical. Same thing with metal. They love classic metal and metal that but when they say young people or females in the bed so something different no 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 they are shit same mm-hmm. thing you know italians are just like that yeah 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 i i have a thing cuz i i like sweet and salty and i like that but i what i've told everybody for years as this is a i've talked about this so much on this podcast i don't like pineapple specifically like mm-hmm. I don't like pineapples, yeah, yeah. Fair. and so uh, so therefore I don't like it on anything. I don't like it on pizza. Absolutely. I don't like it in smoothies. I don't I don't like it. So I was I'm like I'm being the Portland hipster over here, being like, no, I didn't like pineapple on a pizza before. It was cool. I was just like I didn't like pineapples, so of course I'm not gonna like it on pizza or anything else. So that's just kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. my take on it. But I do like other no. sweet and salty things. You know, I like sun dried sun dried tomatoes on the on the pizza. Kind of has a similar vibe, but it tastes different. It works better. For yeah, exactly. Me, so, yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Well, exactly what I was mm-hmm. talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. No, no, but that's yeah. a matter of taste, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, dude, let's uh, let's uh, hang this one up. We'll slide over to Patreon. I have some more questions for you. Does that work for you? Mm-hmm. All right. Yes, yes. All right, everybody. For Federico, this is Blake, and as always, folks, good luck and good tones.
All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Federico and I really, uh, we went somewhere. We went somewhere with Patreon. It was a fun, a fun dive. I learned a lot of phrases that Italians use to describe different parts of the guitar, and they're not exactly what I would have expected, surprisingly enough. It's a really good episode, and if you need more content and you want to help support this show, five bucks a month is all it takes. Just go over to Patreon. That'd be patreon.com slash tone mob. And for just five bucks a month, you can get access to the ad free feed and the bonus episodes of this podcast. Make sure you check out Frozen Crown. Click the links wherever the words are. Thank you so much for tuning in, folks. I really appreciate you. And I will talk to you on the Internet very, very soon. Bye bye. One last thing before we totally sign off here. I just want to remind you that if you do any shopping at Stringjoy, that's Stringjoy Guitar Strings made in Nashville, that will help me out as well. As I've said for years, I'm heavily involved in that company, and I really do think they're making the best products on the market. So if you would like to try custom strings, go to ToneMob.com Stringjoy and check them out today. I seriously, seriously, seriously love what the team down there is doing. I help them out with all kinds of things, and by you supporting them, you are also supporting me as well. And hey, you need some strings, so why not get some custom strings just for your guitar and playing style? Again, the link for that is ToneMob.com slash StringJoy, and that will take you right to their website, and you can do all your shopping through there, and that will help everyone involved out. So thank you very much. Talk to you next time. We are brought to you by the wonderful folks at Gun Street Wiring Shop. Yes, Gun Street Wiring Shop. I've talked about them before. I used to say based out of Bend, Oregon, but guess what? Sean moved to my neck of the woods. Sean's in Portland. Sean is awesome and has helped me with a bunch of stuff lately. And if you have wiring needs for your guitar, he can help you too. If you want to get weird with it, he can get weird. If you just need to spruce things up a little bit, there's your guy. He takes all the guesswork out of doing your guitar wiring and he makes it simple and his customer service is top-notch, and I can't say enough good things about Gunstreet as a company. I really respect Sean and what he's all about, and the product is top-notch. I've got three different guitars that now have Gunstreet harnesses in them, and I could not be happier. So go to GunstreetWiringShop.com and check them out. Hi, this is Chad Nicefield. And this is Justin Press. We're the host of Making Waves, the Shiprock Podcast, a part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. We're inviting you to sail away with us on an epic journey in musical enlightenment. Every week, we bring you only the best artists in rock music and discuss everything from the cruise to the stage to the saga of being a professional recording artist. We'll have lots of special guests along the way, so tune in every week. Your stateroom is available every Monday morning, so welcome aboard. The number you have reached is 100.7 WMMS. It wasn't just a radio station, it was a lifestyle. Cleveland is, is a rock and roll city for sure. I do like the Chicago's. Get down! The Wrath of the Buzzer. WMMS. Cleveland. The rise and fall of one of the most iconic radio stations in America. Profiles. The Wrath of the Buzzard. P-R-O-H Files. Subscribe now wherever you get podcasts.